This is the new Spygate. Well, that was exactly the reaction of many fans after Red Bull higher-ups, including Christian Horner and Helmut Marko, accused Aston Martin of stealing their car design, with especially dire accusations coming from Marko directed at some of the Red Bull personnel that transferred to Aston. Yes, you heard that right. Marco actually alluded to ex-Red Bull employees stealing confidential technical information and using it to design the new Aston Martin car. Thankfully, Marco and the rest have since come to their senses and completely backtracked their vile accusations, and their new excuse is frankly laughable. So let's dive right into this boiling new controversy, and if you want to learn about a new crisis of identity brewing behind the scenes at Red Bull, make sure to watch until the end of the video. Red Bull chief Helmut Marko has appeared to back off claims that Aston Martin copied his team's designs despite a bizarre barrage of criticisms regarding the Silverstone team's showing at the Bahrain Grand Prix. Marko instead came up with the excuse that he and his team had been just joking and had not intended to level any serious charges against the British manufacturer. The side pod design of Aston Martin and Red Bull is strikingly similar, which has aided the team's ascent from the middle of the pack to frontrunner status, with Fernando Alonso's stunning podium finish the talk of the town, so to say. After the chequered flag, team boss Christian Horner and Sergio Perez both laughed at the similarities between the new Aston Martin and the RB18. But when questioned about whether he had any proof to back up Red Bull's claims, Marco told Dutch media, no, not at all. And that's not meant to be an accusation either. Those are just joking remarks. If you look in the field, the Aston Martin is the car most similar to the Red Bull. Aston Martin stole key Red Bull engineer Dan Fallows at the start of last season in a key appointment for the Silverstone-based squad. Twelve months later, Aston Martin is a force to be reckoned with as they chase down their ambition to win the World Championship by 2025. When asked if Red Bull would regret giving up such a crucial player to a rival team, Horner responded, No, because I think we have a wonderful team and everything has to evolve. Nothing stands still. The team principal then went on to suggest Aston Martin had copied the team's blueprint. I think that is flattering to see the resemblance of that car to ours, so it was great to see the three of them on the podium. In the post-race press conference, Perez also made a subtle jab that earned a sly grin from Alonso and Max Verstappen. The joking around at the beginning of the new season may have added some colour and spiciness to the mix, but quite quickly with Marco, Horner and Perez all involved, while Aston Martin did not bite back, it started to feel a little unfair on the Silverstone squad. As 2022 marked the beginning of a brand new regulatory era in Formula 1, it's only natural that teams would in some way follow the path blazed by the teams who made the best starts with these ground effect challenges, and that was Red Bull. And after taking Fallows' move into consideration, it would have seemed rather strange if the AMR23 had shared very few similarities with the dominant RB18. Red Bull themselves had predicted that more cars would be looking something like theirs or Ferraris in terms of design in F1 2023, those two teams having led the way in 2022, and this indeed has proven true. As Sky Sports F1 pundit Karun Chandok put it, the reality is last year they started the year with a car that wasn't very good. They put their ego aside. They were willing to throw away the time and effort they invested in that and ultimately made the decision for Barcelona to produce a copycat Red Bull. It upset a lot of people at Red Bull last year, but it meant they kind of wrote off a lot of last season when they had to understand. When you just copy something, it doesn't mean you fully understand it. So Red Bull were annoyed by it and are still annoyed by it. But Aston spent last year understanding their philosophy and then they've improved on it and they produced this car that's based on an already strong package last year. Red Bull's amazing 1-2 finish at Sakir follows in line with a dominant 2022 in which they won 17 of the 22 races. Based solely on their performance in Bahrain, it appears that the reigning constructors' champion's dominance in 2023 may be on par with that of 2022. However, team principal Horner has made an effort to keep Red Bull grounded by admitting that it was only one race and that they needed to be efficient with the car's development over the course of the entire season if they want to win. For the first race of the year, to bring them home as we did with the handicap of the wind tunnel time and everything else, I think the team has done an amazing job, he said. To have this as a starting point, of course, we've now got to be efficient in our development moving forward. Every circuit will have its different challenges, but it's a great start for the team. The RB19 won't be as dominant for very long, according to Horner, 
who also predicted that other teams will catch up with their designs as they gain a better understanding of their own vehicles. But in addition to the realities of technological development, what is taking place at Red Bull currently behind the scenes may also be of concern. Off track, the effects of the wider company's transformation following co-founder Dietrich Mateschitz's passing last autumn are starting to manifest. Mateschitz's old role was effectively split into three, with Oliver Mintzlaff moving up from being chief executive of Red Bull's RB Leipzig football club to a chief executive of corporate projects and investments role that encompasses all the firm's media and sporting projects, including the F1 teams. Now, it didn't take long for rumours to circulate that Mintzlaff had little interest in motorsport and had a strained relationship with Red Bull motorsport advisor Helmut Marko. And some direct remarks made by Marco about Mintzlaff's leadership were shockingly published last week on Red Bull Media House's own Speed Week website. We met twice, said Marco. He was given some insight. How well he'll respond to our ideas remains to be seen. Red Bull Racing has always been very autonomous. It's no longer the case that I call with a report after every practice and race. The direct, personal, friendly relationship is no longer there. Diddy was a visionary, had emotions. I'm not seeing that anymore. I'm a free person, I can stop at any time if I'm no longer enjoying it. We'll see how the future goes." Marco has had a unique but significant role in Red Bull's rise in the motorsports world, one that is comparable to Niki Lauda's former role at Mercedes but less formal. His power came directly from his friendship with Mateschitz, who had first approached him as a fan at a hill climb when Marco was still competing. Mateschitz was drawn to Marco because the latter had been a close friend of Jochen Rindt, the 1970 F1 posthumous champion who Mateschitz had idolised. Mateschitz was the only person Marco reported to, and even then he did so as a close friend rather than an employee. As a result of his position, he has been in charge of many choices that have shaped Red Bull's growth into a superpower in motorsports. Marco had complete autonomy over who he wanted to accept or reject from Red Bull's junior driver programme. He played a key role in not only bringing Max Verstappen on board, but also in mid-season, promoting him to Red Bull's senior F1 team. Marco gave that idea the impetus it needed. Although Marco has made significant contributions to Red Bull, his almost independent existence within the Empire, due to his close relationship with Mateschitz, and Mateschitz alone may make him a less natural fit for a business that is now adopting a more conventional corporate structure. Marco is not under Horner's control. Marco has a history of speaking his mind and be willing to throw verbal bombs into the mix. But the importance of accountability is likely to increase in the post Mateschitz Red Bull. Marco has never answered to anyone in his life, and given that he will turn 80 next month, he might not feel inclined to do so now. It was never likely that things would continue as usual for the Red Bull Empire after Mateschitz's passing, despite all the efforts to keep the train on the same tracks. It's one thing to establish yourself as the leader in a crowded market. It takes something special to accomplish this while also building a massive side project empire of media companies, extreme sports, and world championship competitions. That was all made possible by Mateschitz who had the vision, and that's irreplaceable. So what do you think about Red Bull's precarious situation now that the structure at the top has shifted so much? Could this be dangerous for the continuation of their F1 team? And what about their accusations against Aston Martin? Do you buy their we're just joking excuse? Give us your opinions in the comment section down below.